Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm making um, a video response to Azizo. Hope I spelled that right, said, said that right. Azizo 92. Azizo 92 is a viewer, and Azizo 92 left a comment uh, on what should be my next video lecture, and um, he or she said um, anything having to do with logic. Now that's pretty broad, and the reason why I decided to do this video rather than some of the other formalized logic suggestions or comments that I got was that well if it's going to be on anything in logic then I should do something I should do something fun. Um, what I'm going to do today is similar to this this the last sort of um, sort of spacey logic video that I did with respect to um, Zizek and Rumsfeld's argument in which we use epistemic modal logic. I'm going to start a new playlist called Experimental Logic. That'll be my first video in my Experimental Logic series. And this will be my second video in my Experimental Logic video. So, um, Azizo92, thanks for the question. I appreciate you watching. This video is for you and for all of you uh, interested logicians. So, uh, with, respect to, with respect to Azizo92's question, I actually have been thinking about this idea for a while. Um, and of course, the reason why I'm doing a YouTube video on it is because I've never seen it formalized or discussed in any sense in any logic text on any level. Um, and, and also because I'm, I'm, I'm a big time robot AI fan, right? And everybody's talking about sort of the singularity and what's going to happen. I saw this Time magazine, I think it was Time or Newsweek or one of those magazines, where they were talking about the singularity in like 2035 or 2045 where machines can sort of outthink human beings, right? Um, and they're saying now, you know, I saw Watson compete on Jeopardy and that was amazing, right? Um, so everybody's like, wow, machines can do so much, machines can do so much. Um, it's just a matter of time before they supplant our intellectual ability. However, there's, there's a problem with machines. Machines can't overcome this one thing right now. Um, and I, I, I don't, I'm not going to go through notes, um, but I do have some things up here because I just won't remember it. It's called CAPTCHA, I think is what it's called. C-A-P-T-C-H-A. Right? C-A-P-T-C-H-A. So basically the idea is, um, if you're a blogger like me, I have a blog, I get a lot of hits, a lot of views, you know, I do a lot of blogging, and I end up getting haters. And the haters spam my, my comment box, right? So I get tons and tons and tons of spam. Well, I used to get tons and tons and tons of spam. Because I didn't have this technology integrated into my blog comment section. And basically what happens is, um, it's a way to determine whether or not the user is a human or a robot. Obviously, robots can identify text fields. They can populate the text fields with random text or with specific text, and they can hit send, and you get this spam alert. The way to get around spam is to implement this, right? So if you think of it like this, it's like human beings versus computers. Right now, with respect to this technology, capture, I think is how it's pronounced, technology, humans are beating robots. So we can't even talk about singularity until robots are able to get past this, right? Ro right now, robots, to my knowledge, can't do this. They, they can't circumvent this technology. And in a sense, I am arguing for increased spam, right? Once the machine figures out how to circumvent this, the machine's gotten smarter, which will force us to get smarter and thus the volley b between us and the robots. <laughs> um, so it's ESO, uh 92, you got to be careful for what you wish because you, you just might get it. So, what the hell does that have to do with logic? Well, um, it's my belief, I was thinking, well, why is it, uh, now I'm not a computer programmer and, a, and I'm also not a logic professor. I don't, I've never taught logic in a classroom, but I do consume logic books as a hobby. So take whatever logic that I do on my channel with a grain of salt, right? I'm not a logic professor, but I am very, very comfortable in, in rather advanced levels of, of mathematical and logical analysis. This led me to think about the problem that the machine must be having from a logical standpoint, not from sort of an engineering standpoint, from a logical standpoint, can I make an account for a reason, a logical account, for the reason why machines can't do this? And I think I might be able to. Now this is purely conjecture, this is purely sort of experimental logic as the title suggests, um, and I'm asking those of you logicians, and I know I have many, many of you logicians that watch my videos, to sort of contribute to this discussion on what you think, right? Okay, so uh, the title of this video is, I'm gonna call it, um, shh, 
stratified, stratified existential quantification, Q U A N T I F I. Stratified existential quantification and the logic of and the logic of challenge response testing. Okay, so a somewhat uh, a somewhat ridiculous uh, title. Okay, so what in the world does all this mean? Um, here's conceptually what I think the problem is, right? So I'm going to go through the logic slowly because unlike the Zizek video, I do want to involve more people. And I've done enough logic on my YouTube channel that if you've watched the video and if, you, if you're already steeped in logic, or even if you're not steeped in logic but you've been watching the videos, the logic videos that I have up, some of this should make sense. I'm going to introduce, however, a new quantifier that I've never introduced before. Right? And this is the quantifier. Right? This quantifier is called the unique... This is called the unique existential quantifier. And it looks like the existential quantifier with an exclamation point, right? Um, so we have this new quantifier, the unique existential quantifier. This is the first time that I've ever done a discussion di talking about the unique existential quantifier. I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about the function that the unique existential quantifier has. It's very, very sort of simple. It's deceptively simple. We're going to complicate it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the unique existential quantifier, and then I'm going to integrate that into sort of what I'm thinking is a, um, a logic of challenge response testing, which is this stuff, right? The reason why I think logically computers can't beat this is because, in some sense, it relates, I think, to this. I'm, this is, again, this is just me sort of freestyling it. You logicians and math nerds chime in and tell me what you think. Another thing I really like about stuff like this is YouTube is going to time stamp this video, right? So it'll be like, no, you know, that thing was first introduced into the marketplace of ideas on the date that Dr. Campbell put the video up, right? So it's there to be consumed. Okay, so this means um, um, this, uh, if I could write, this and only this, right? This specific one right here, so like, like this, right? Um, this and only this. Uh, it's, it's abstention, right? It's that one there, right? I don't mean some of these things or a few of those things. I mean that thing right there, right? This one and only this one is signified by what's known as the unique existential quantifier. So that, that's pretty basic, right? I mean that one. Okay, so we get it. There's, there's simple proofs, simple, simple sort of algebraic proofs that you can use to prove um, the, the function of the unique existential quantifier. Right? So, for example, let's say we're talking about the unique existential quantifier um, N as being an element of, uh, let's say, um, A plus 7 equals 10. Just as an example, right? So we have the um, unique existential quantifier, right, N, is an element of this, right? A plus 7 equals 10. And this is like basic, like, like algebra of high school and middle school algebra, right? What you do is we assign two, two variables um, in this, right? So we'll say like a plus 7 equals 10, right? And b plus 7 equals 10, for example. Right? And I'm sort of skipping some steps, but I'm going to try and make it as basic and user-friendly as possible because I really want you to have an understanding of what this is when I get more complicated in the discussion, right? When the discussion gets a little bit more um, in depth. So what ends up happening is if I want to demonstrate this, I would, you know how this works, right? You subtract whatever's on this side, subtract whatever's on that side, so on. If it was division, you would bring it over, so on. So you just subtract seven, right? So that cancels out. You subtract seven, and that cancels out. Whatever you do to one side, you do to the other side. Again, like basic, you know, algebra stuff. 10 minus seven is three. Uh, minus 7, 10 minus 7 is 3, so we get B, this cancels out, is equal to 3, and we get A, 
is equal to 3, right? So a is equal to 3, and b is equal to 3, therefore we can make the claim that a is equal to b, right? I've demonstrated that we are uniquely speaking about this and only this, in, in terms of this example, it would be, it would be uh, 3, right? So we're talking specifically about 3. Okay, hopefully that is, uh, that's somewhat intelligible, right? That's, it's, it's, it's pretty basic, but that's, that's basically what we're looking at, right? Okay, so now, how does that relate to this idea of challenge response testing? Now, I don't know that this is right, right? The whole reason for me doing these videos is to get a discussion going, right? Because I do want to put my two cents in to make the machine smarter, right? And if what I'm doing, in any sense, triggers a thought in um, some engineer's head, it's like, you know, Dr. Campbell might be right, let's try this and that, then, wow, that's cool, I've contributed my bit, right? Um, and this is all I can really do. So, as I said, take what I'm doing with a grain of salt. So I started thinking, right, I started thinking, and the important thing in logic is not, it really isn't that you need an in-depth understanding of the symbols or an in-depth understanding of the syntax. None of that really is important at all. And I've shown in previous videos on Polish notation, nano operators, and predicate logic, that all of those things are intertwined, right? That's all, and I've demonstrated, um, though Spoonwood showed me where I messed up that, at, at one point, I demonstrated the equality of the various systems, right? We're all talking the same language. So now that we know that that's true, um, let's not look into the symbolization as problematic. Let's just think conceptually, right? So I got this idea when I was um, watching my daughter um, have ice cream. We went to Cold Stones and she had an ice cream cone, and, you know, she's, drink, she's eating ice cream cone, and like all kids, they play with their food, right? So they're, they're, you know, she's licking the ice cream cone, it's taking forever, and at the bottom of the ice cream, it started to drip, right? So there's little drips falling from the tip of the, the bottom of the ice cream. And I don't know why it caught my eye, but I, I was looking at it, and I was like, I started to think about sort of the shape, right? And it sort of, it, it sort of looked like this, right? It looks like this, right? It looks like this, right? Not necessarily like that, but you get the idea of the ice cream. The base of the ice cream cone with the ice cream on top is wider than the point. It, it, all of this comes to a point, right? And then, like, you have particular drips, right? It's dripping, right? So this would be, you know, my ice cream. So I guess this is my, the, the ice cream analogy to uh, discussing um, um, what I'm going to discuss as stratified existential quantification, which doesn't exist. But I think it should exist, if, if this makes sense, right? So, like, here's the ice cream, and, like, here's the drip, right? So I started to think about it, right? If we're talking in terms of quantification, right, and quantifiers, well, in my mind, I can account for three quantifiers. And I'm not sure that machines can do what I can do, right? I recognize, and I've lectured on this before, that we have the quantification for all x, Right? And this is our universal quantification, right, for all x, and it means all, right? For all x, dot, 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 dot. So um, an example of universal quantification would be something like this, and I've done this already. All of this I've actually done, so hopefully I'm, I'm re I really want to bring all of you in, because I've done these lectures before. I did a lecture on Venn diagrams, so... If you're not comfortable with Venn diagrams, watch the lecture that I did on Venn diagrams so that you have an understanding of what I'm about to discuss, right? So in universal quantification, what ends up happening is I have, let, let's say, S and P, right? I have this circle S, I have this circle P, and shading in says that it's empty. Nothing occupies that section. So obviously nothing occupies the section of this Venn that is completely S. I mean, yeah, completely S. Here's P. Here's S and P, right? So here's P, and here's uh, S and P, right? So if we were to talk about the symbolization of this Venn diagram, um, what we would say is for all, for all X, right? If X is an S, right? For all X, if S, X is an S, if it's here, then it has to be a P, all right? So that we can symbolize this Venn, this Venn relationship as for all X, if X is an S, then X is a P. 
And we recognize that has to be true because here it is, if it's an S, right, it has to also be contained within P. So all S are P is basically what it's saying, right? So you can say that all S are P. Okay, so we, we recognize the function of the universal. Okay, what does that have to do anything? Just, just work with me, right? But then we also recognize the function of not just the universal, but the existential, right? So we can talk about the existential, right? And with respect to the existential, we're not talking about all things, we're talking about some things, right? So a, a, a limited set. And simply, again, I've done this video before, and there's, I have a published, uh, or not published, but I uploaded um, a PDF so that you can follow along. So if you want more information on events, type in events into my search box and watch my videos on events. But with respect to the existential quantification, if we're looking at S and P, right, if we're looking at S and P, then we recognize that if we have this symbolization, X says that there is something exists within that state. So something was, exists within the S state. We can say that this is represented by, um, there is at least one X, or there is an X, right? There is an X, not for all X, but there is an X, or there is at least one X, right? Such that that X, right, S of X, right? X is an S, and it is not a P, all right? It's here, and here's where, it, so this is S, right? This is S, this is, uh, oops, if I, did, I wrote that backward. This is S and P, and this is just P. So this is an S, but not a P. So we see there is an X such that that X is an S and that X is not a P. No part of that is a P, right? So we have our universal um, quantification. We have our existential quantification. A universal quantification is broader, it's bigger, it's more inclusive than our existential quantification, right? And here's where, I, you know, again, I'm just throwing this out there. Some of this could be right, wrong, it's more idea. I want to sort of get concepts out there and try and come up with some new, new stuff, right? So we've moved from a, a claim of all to a claim of some, right? Some is smarter, uh, is smarter, is smaller than all. Some implies, by definition, that there is others outside of it, specifically P, right? Not this, right? So, I mean, that's just, that's just fact, right? That just, that just is. So we move from all to some. Now we can introduce, because I discussed earlier, our unique existential quantifier, right? Because the unique existential quantifier is even more specific than our existential quantifier, right? So that you can think of this as a progression. It's like the ice cream cone, right? It's, and that's, I, I wasn't thinking about it then, but you know, there's a reason why I use the ice cream cone example, because something about that triggered something in my mind. And I'm like, well, no, that's, now we're talking about something that we can define ostensibly, right? So the unique existential quantifier which is represented by uh, the existential quantifier and an exclamation point, right? What we're talking about is this specific, this specific one, right? We're talking about that one right there, this and only this, right? So, I mean, pretend, probably I should probably put this and only this. So we've moved from all to some, to something very exclusive, from something very, very general to something specific, right? You can see logically, um, that this makes sense. But more importantly than it making logical sense, and let me give you an example. I mean, obviously here's the example that I gave before. So we have, um, um, there is uh, this and only this n is an element of um, a plus seven is equal to 10, right? And I've demonstrated how that is accurate, right? So we've moved from our universal, um, we've moved from our universal uh, quantifier to an existential quantifier to a unique existential existential quantifier, from something very, very general to something very, very specific. Okay. Now, all of that is sort of just background information. It, it's, it's, it's a little, I think it's a little novel because I haven't seen any logic textbook sort of explain it like this, but it's an understanding amongst logicians. It's just cool, I think, to sort of get it out there into the marketplace of ideas, right, so that we can discuss this type of stuff. But but, but that's just a part of it. So now I start thinking, right? Um, so Azizo 92, here, here's, here's where 
I engage, uh, I give you a response because you said, hey, anything on logic, right? So this is what I want to talk about experimentally. My thing is, um, when we talk about the unique existential quantifier, or we talk about the universal existential quantifier, we are talking in terms of absolutes, right? If I'm talking about the unique existential quantifier, I'm talking about I'm talking about three. I'm not talking about four. I'm not talking about three point one. I'm not talking about three and a third. I'm talking about three in this example, right? I'm talking about something very specific, right? I'm talking about an absolute claim. When we're talking about the universal existential qualifier, we're talking about something absolute. Every single member of that set, all of them, right? However, what I'm starting to recognize is that there must be various levels of what I want to call stratified existential quantifiers. Now, this is something that I just made up, right? Um, I, I, I don't, you know, logicians and scientists don't invent stuff. It's a discovery. I, I don't know that I've discovered anything. I'm not trying to say anything like that. But I know that there are corollaries in, in, um, in calculus, right? There are varying degrees of infinity bigger and larger sets of infinity, right? You have a, a set of infinity that's smaller than another set of infinity. And that idea in, in sort of calculus, um, I think, might and has to apply to logic. Specifically, it cannot apply, the stratification can't apply to um, a unique existential quantifier because we're talking about just one. It can't apply specifically to a universal quantifier because we're talking about everything but it should be able to apply to an existential quantifier. Why? If I have, and here's where, this is just conceptual, right? I'm not saying that this, this is to make sort of syntactical or well-formed formula sense. This is just conceptual sense, right? So you got to cut me some slack here, right? Just to try and get an idea, right? If we have the existential uh, quantifier, right, plus one, some other thing, Right, some other thing, whatever that other thing might be, and you might let's say we label it as a, right, something that's not n, right. So we have the existential quantifier, this particular one plus some other member, right. Well, in a sense, conceptually, for me, and this is where I'm just throwing ideas out here. This is, as I said, I'm not trying to say that this is definitive. This is just ideas. To me, that seems like what I'm saying now is some. It has to be some, right. In certain sense, it has to be some. I can't specifically make an addition to the existential, the unique existential quantifier without it becoming um, some, right? There, there, there's, there's some members in that set, right? Okay. Um, okay, well, if we have the universal quantifier, right? If we have the universal quantifier and we subtract um, a member from an instantiated member, Right? So, like, for example, we go from universal generalization to universal instantiation, UG to UI. Let's say we instantiate with B, right? So, um, if we go from a universal generalization, right, a universal generalization, and we subtract um, an instantiation from that, the potential to instantiate from that, right? We say there is no longer a potential to instantiate from that set. Well, isn't that, isn't that some? Aren't we also saying that that's some, right? It's, it's some because it was all, but something has been removed from it, so it's some. Now, if the set changes and the set is now all, then, you know, maybe not. And this might be confusing, but I'm just throwing stuff out there, right? So it would seem to me that this set, right, this set, this, quantif this set is larger than... Now, I can think of s s instances where it would be the same where all is a member of two, right? But I'm not going to talk about that. It would seem to be that this sum, this sum, right? This uh, sum, this uh, existential um, is larger than this, right? It seems like there is some sense in which it can be stratified. We can talk about the, the set of sum having varying degrees, right? We can talk, about, it makes sense logically, I think, right? And uh, as I said, I don't see this in any books and you know, I don't have any pride because I'm not a logician anyway. I'm not a, I don't teach logic, so I don't have anything to lose. My reputation isn't on the line or anything. It's just more <laughs> trying, to, 
trying to get the, the ideas out there. It seems to be the case that we should be able to talk about a stratified existential, we should be able to talk about stratified existential quantification. In my mind, um, uh, a universal, the universal quantification minus a member is a larger set of sum than um, a unique existential quantifier plus one member, right? Um, given certain caveats, which, you know, conceptually I can think of, but I don't want to get into right now, right? So this very, very large set minus, minus uh, one. So for example, let's say there's 100 members in the set, right? And that equals all, right? So roughly the idea is if I take 100 minus one, that's 99, and that equals sum, right? But if I also take one, the number one, and I add one, I take the existential, unique existential, um, I take the unique existential quantifier and I add a member, I have two, but two is also sum, right? So this is sum and this is sum, but this existential, this existential claim is larger than this existential claim. So we're both saying that, and then obviously just to talk about one, would be to talk about unique. Right, so we have all stratified existential quantification and something unique. I don't know that anyone's ever said that, but I think that's the way I, I almost know. I don't care if what anybody else says. I know that this is how my mind works. I, I might not be good enough in logic to be able to, to demonstrate a proof for that. I think somebody else who's much smarter than me, I know someone, if what I'm saying, saying makes sense, who's much smarter than me can probably prove that, but conceptually, logically, it has to, it, it just has to follow, right? Our minds are able to go from all to some. Now, how does this relate to um, challenge response testing? Well, it seems to me that what ends up happening is I'm given form. So like in a platonic sense, right? The idea of form. And we can look at form as all, right? So that's easy. But the specific form I'm trying to identify in, in a determination of whether the thing is a human being or a robot might be the word uh, this, right? So in order, like it has this and its waves and lines through it and different font, and the computer isn't smart enough to recognize this, the word this. The computer is smart enough to recognize that it's a form. It might be smart enough to recognize that it might be a letter, letter being some of the forms, right? Forms can have many different... A letter is um, a smaller set of forms, right? Uh, English letters are, are an even smaller set of forms, and so on, right? So we're going from a universal to a unique. This being the unique, this being... So it's this... The computer can do this easy, right? And it's not that the computer can't identify this, right? When it's just typed out in, like, regular Microsoft Docs and stuff. But what it can't do is it can't pull out this, the word T-H-I-S, as embedded in this technology because, because it can't differentiate the form, the nature of the forms, right? So for me, it seems if there were a series of steps that the computer could make where it goes through some existential, stratified existential quantification, more and more specifically, deductions, I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there, this is sort of like brainstorming, right? Where it recognized, first you would have to recognize the existence of stratified existential quantification, which to my knowledge doesn't exist, I don't know anybody that's talked about it. But if the computer says, okay, this is in forms, within forms, here's a, here's a smaller set of sum, here's a smaller set of sum, here's a smaller set of sum, an even smaller set of sum, an even smaller set, we're, we're approaching, we're moving from a universal claim um, going through a going through series of stratified existential claims to arrive at um, a unique existential quantified claim, this particular one, or the word this, or uh, the image of a cat, or something like that. Sorry, my battery died. Um, so maybe maybe that's how our mind works, right? Maybe that's how our mind works. Maybe our mind is the type of thing that can move from, and I think our mind is the type of thing that can move from universal claims to very unique claims, but maybe the things that the computer scientists and programmers haven't recognized yet, um, which is at least possible, it's here for discussion, is that maybe we should start talking about a, a stratified existential quantification, right? Maybe we should start, maybe we should start discussing stratified existential quantification because it seems 
um, to be justified in, um, in, in forms of various forms of calculus, right? Um, so why not in logic? And I don't know specific. this might just be my ignorance, but I don't know that anyone's articulated this in logic, this notion of stratified um, existential, existential quantification. And then also recognize that going through this process from all to this particular unique thing, right? Um, that this, this sort of triad, um, for me at least, right, I see this triad as how our mind operates, right? The structure of not just logical thought, but the structure of, of epistemology, right? Um, hence, you know, part of this is sort of incorporated in epistemic modal logic and other questions that I had with respect to my, my Zizek video, right? But for me, this is what you need, right, in order to really be able to think. Um, I won't say this is the only thing you need, but this is a huge, in a Kantian sense, this would be the condition for the possibility of your thinking in logical terms, right? The ability to have the type of mind, we are the type of thing that is able to discern all to this. Um, but without recognizing that there's, I think, some stratification in here, computers aren't going to be able to get past this. Once computers recognize that, I argue, maybe, potentially, that there is some stratification here, it can make, um, you can sort of create a decision-making process where it, it looks at all of the different, all of the different um, stratified existential claims from the largest possible to the smallest possible, and it's able then to identify, I mean, computers obviously can think extremely fast, right? It's able to sort of narrow all of the possibilities to unique, um, unique possibilities. So, uh, with that being said, um, it, it looks it looks pretty intimidating, but it really it really shouldn't be intimidating. Especially if you're watching, if you've watched all of my logic videos, you should know what all of this means, and 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 that'll be good for me because then I'll get feedback from more people, right? So I want to try and get back as much feedback feedback as possible on, on this question. So. Um, Azizo92, uh, you said anything in logic, so that's what I have for you. Hope you appreciate my video response to your question. Again, if you guys want to have me answer questions or do videos, um, click the video that says what, um, what should my lex lecture be. Leave a comment. You don't have to watch the video, but just leave, leave a comment, and that's where I'll go to answer the, the questions and do videos that you, that you want me to do. Uh, with that being said, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.